morning guys. Um, this video is all about how to get started um, in wildlife photography. Now there's probably three main aspects we need to think about. The first one is the technical side of photography. So how do we get a sharp picture that's well exposed? The second one's composition. So how do we create a pleasing image uh, that's uh, good to look at? And the third one is probably the hardest actually. How do we actually find wildlife to photograph? So we'll look at these three areas um, in this video. Now um, I'm going to look at that basically do an overview uh, because uh, if I go into really great detail this video is going to be so long um, you know nobody's going to be able to uh, nobody's going to want to uh, watch it. So um, but if you like this video and uh, you want to go and look at these areas in really great detail I've got a um, an online course a wildlife photography course that's downloadable and streamable and I'll leave that in the link below. Um, there's two lessons, one's on general wildlife photography, so photographing birds, mammals and stuff like that, and there's a second lesson on macro photography um, and there's projects to shoe and uh, um, critique from me uh, once you've done those projects. So um, I'm not going to uh, talk about that anymore, so let's crack on. Um, there's loads of reedbed birds and swallows flying past actually, so uh, I'm trying not to get distracted. Now, when it comes to the technical aspect, the most there's two things that are really important. We need a picture that's sharp and we need a picture that's well exposed. So in order to get a sharp picture, we need to first avoid camera shake. So we need to shoot with a fast enough shutter speed not to get sh camera shake. Uh, and then secondly, we need a fast enough shutter speed to uh, freeze the motion of that animal that we're trying to photograph. So it would depend on uh, quite a few variables. Uh, but generally, if you're doing birds in flight, um, you want, if it's sort of a static bird, you know, like a bird on a stick, for example, you probably want a thousandth of a second to avoid uh, any movement of that animal and uh, any camera shake. Because when you're using a long lens, any movement that as you're holding the camera gets magnified so camera shake can be a problem and unless it's really bad camera shake you might not notice it when you're looking at your screen on the back of the camera and it's only when you get that picture home that it just looks a bit soft so we need to avoid camera shake and then depending on how fast the bird's moving we need to avoid um, any blurred movement and generally that would de depend obviously on how fast that bird's moving, but as a starting point, a two thousandth of a second is probably gonna be okay. So a static animal, thousandth of a second, um, moving animal, two thousandth of a second. There, it, you know, we would go into greater detail, uh, it will depend on what it, the thing you're photographing, and it does depend on focal length, so how long that focal length is, you know, how long your lens is. But that's a good, sort of starting point really. Uh, and then in order, in order to get a sharp picture, we also need it to be well focused. And uh, modern cameras have got great autofocus systems. Um, and there's never been a better time to be a wildlife photographer. Not only have we got continuous focusing, so in other words, the camera will continually focus to try and keep that moving animal in focus, but we've also got on lots of cameras, uh, I haven't got it on this one unfortunately, but the next camera I buy should have it, uh, there's uh, animal eye detect. And that's where the camera will pick out the eye, or if it's a little bit further away, the head of the animal you're looking to photograph. So if it's a bird in flight, it will try and pick out the eye of that bird in flight and uh, lock onto that and uh, in order to give you a sharp picture. And you know, it works really, really well. It's a real, almost a game changer, I think, really, when it comes to getting sharp pictures of moving subjects. There's not much around today, but I've just got a picture of an Abaset, and they're fantastic little wading birds. Really nice to see, actually. Um, but anyway, let's get back to what we're talking about in this video. So the next area would be composition. And when it comes to composition, it's not too difficult, to be honest. Um, generally, you want to avoid putting your animal in the center of the frame. You want to put it off to one side. It's called rule of thirds. Uh, it's um, one of those sort of basic concept, concepts, but it works really well. Um, the other thing as well, and it's really, really, really important, 
ideally you want to be level with the subject's uh, head or eye so if you've got something uh, an animal that's low on the ground you need to get low down and if it's high up you need to, you know need to be high up so when you're in one of these heights and i'm in a fixed hide at the moment uh, you haven't got the choice of getting low to the ground so i tend to concentrate on uh, animals that are in flight or in this case i've got reed beds over there so if anything pops up onto a reed bed that'll be at my eye level so it'll be perfect um, if i'm doing wading birds um, that are sort of looking for food in amongst uh, the mud and the water then i wouldn't necessarily pick an area like this that's got a height you know a man-made hide i would uh, get some camo i've got like a, a camouflaged uh, poncho that i put over myself or i'd use a little a little hide low level hide so i can get low to the ground so that would be the two main things uh, use rule of thirds so get your animal off center and camera height is super super important you need or you want to be level with the animal's head When it comes to finding things to photograph, so finding wildlife, if you're just starting out in wildlife photography, it probably makes sense to go to a local lake where there are lots of common subjects and you can spend hours and hours practicing. So you can practice, in, practice the focusing, you can practice getting the right exposure and uh, hone the actual technical skills. Once you've got those, those, um, those skills, then um, we want to look for stuff that's a little bit more interesting. It might be worth going to um, local riverbanks, uh, check out the tide times and uh, photograph waders. So then uh, generally the waders will come in on an incoming tide. So the tide pushes them along the tide line and that's where they feed. Uh, look for nature reserves. They're a really good start. So come into a hide like this where it's all set up and hopefully there'll be stuff coming in and out, especially when you've got like a scrape or something over there and you've got water birds. So that'll be a good shout. And then the other thing I would say is it's really important to know about the animals you want to photograph. The more you know about their behaviour and their lifestyles, uh, the more chance you've got of finding them. So for example, uh, if it's a migratory species and you know when that bird's going to migrate in or out of a certain area, then you've got a much greater chance of finding that bird. So for example, um, in Essex we get Brent geese coming in October and there's certain areas along the... Um, are the Thames estuary and other estuaries in Essex and I know that's a great time to photograph that type of uh, that type of bird so I can be there and ready and predict when they're going to come in at a certain time of the year um, so and then last but not least um, social media is a really 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 good tool so if you join lots of local um, wildlife or nature Facebook groups then you know you'll start to see when various animals are coming into your area when something maybe unusual has popped up or something rare and you can message a person and maybe they'll share that information maybe they won't but maybe they will often you can work out where that animal's photographed if you know your local area uh, twitter is another good one and it's worth joining the twitter feed of maybe the rspb uh, the specific nature reserves and uh, essex wildlife or the wildlife trusts so i would say they're the good areas start with something like that's really easy while you're learning the technical skills local uh, ponds, lakes, maybe a uh, coastline with gulls and stuff like that. Hone your skills and then start to look for other areas. So you can use nature reserves with uh, purpose-built hides like this and then it might be worth buying your own hide, pop-up hide and you can carry that on your back. As I say I've got a couple of those. I've also got a poncho which literally is like a camouflage cloth that just easily uh, goes into my camera bag. I can use that uh, to camouflage me from the wildlife learn about behavior so you can work out what areas are going to be good for what type of animal that you, you know sort of animal you want to photograph that day ideally and then a social media great tool so look, i hope you found this video uh, helpful and interesting um, thanks for watching and uh, if you have enjoyed it if you can consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already subscribed uh, if you can give it a like a thumbs up that'll be great uh, a share and if you've got any uh, anything you'd like to comment on on this video or wildlife photography in general add it in the comments section below and as I say I'll add a link to my 
uh, downloadable and streamable, uh, streamable lessons on wildlife photography. So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll speak to you on my next video. Oh yeah, um, one other thing, if you do subscribe, press the little bell icon and hopefully you'll be notified when my next video is uploaded. And I do lots of content like this, wildlife photography, nature photography, um, yeah. And it would be great to have you along for the ride. So uh, thanks for watching and I'll speak to you on my next video.